All right, let's get started. So the inner work of racial justice. Um, I uh, have had the privilege of joining with the wisdom community and sharing about how research is helping us see how these practices that we have been privileged to inherit from cultures of depth and long standing in Asia and elsewhere around the world, indigenous and other often underappreciated and sometimes marginalized communities. I've been part of the subgroup among us who's been really looking at how these practices can support us in helping us address issues of our social and cultural world that lead to what some of us call surplus suffering. By surplus suffering, we mean that, as we all know, as human beings, as the Buddha and others have taught, as we all know from our experience, we will suffer. Um, sickness, old age, death, attaching, pushing things away, um, ignorance, delusion. Surplus suffering, though, is that suffering that results from the various ways that our cultures, our societies, our communities organize, uh, create wealth, create resources, create systems that um, distribute resources, and often, actually, historically, have done so in ways that unevenly distribute those resources so that suffering, additional suffering, right, occurs and is often linked with these histories of oppression. So racism, sexism, heteronormativity, classism, ableism. You all know what I'm talking about, right? And so for the next few minutes, what I'd like us to do is really think about turning toward those painful aspects of our everyday experiences, looking inwardly at what we know about how that kind of extra pain is something we, we've seen in our midst, right? We sort of see and don't see it fully, partly because we've been trained, conditioned to see certain types of pain and not see certain others to see certain people and not see others completely. So taking a moment now to just mm, feel our way into this, this conversation by sensing into how it is that you open up to turn toward issues of, let's say, social suffering, identity-based harm, bias, racism, sexism, et cetera, the intersections of those. What happens when you're invited to actually look at those aspects of the pain in our lives. Let's imagine, for some people, what often happens is a kind of fear, anxiety, some sort of discomfort, right? Take a moment to do a micro practice with me. What happens when we feel our way into a conversation like this from a place of mm, fear or anxiety? What happens to the body? How do you feel? the anxiety, the anxiousness, the difficulty of looking at these issues, what does it feel like in your body? What do you know about that in your bones? So imagine coming into the conversation from that, from remembering that, from feeling your way into it as an embodied experience that you carry in you right now, something, some aspect of right now. So my question to you is if you, from this place, take a look at this photo. What comes up for you right now from this place? We're doing a bit of a micro practice to sense into what we already know about how our bodies move into and around these issues of social identity based oppression. What comes up from this place of anxiousness, fear, I don't know what to say? I mean, look at this face. We'll come back to this face. I want us to say that we are, as we, as we sit today, right, we're meeting in a moment of obviously some chaos, some suffering and distress around issues like this. Um, wherever we look, we see examples of this. I was just actually in Arizona um, presenting and working with Arizona State University. They have a beautiful new um, Center for Mindfulness, Compassion and Resilience. And they did a, a day-long conference looking at social justice as an aspect of their work. I was privileged to go there and hold space, present, met a young woman who shared that she had just arrived at our gathering from a protest against disproportionate police application of force that had led to the murder 
of a 14-year-old, the killing of a 14-year-old Latino man in January of this year in Tempe, Arizona. His name was Antonio Arces, and he was killed by police, like as has happened in the last decade or so, we hear stories like this of a young man often who, for whatever reason, has a toy gun, right? Many of us as men, maybe some women as well, have had some experience around toy guns. And we know that men, boys of color, are very vulnerable when they act in ways that boys have done in our culture for years, for, across history, and play with guns. Antonio Arces lost his life in January in Tempe, Arizona, having a kind of an air gun that police mistook for a gun. And so protests around that are just happening right now. And when we look all around, we see examples like that, that a lot of pain and suffering, again, is being maldistributed. Some communities are suffering more than others. I was born into such a time many, many years ago. I was born in, I'm going to name it, because I think it matters, like the particular arc on the planet that we've seen and lived through. 1967, Kinston, North Carolina. Right? When I say it, you can hear it in my voice. I'm not a, originally a California girl from the South. And I was born in the last year of Martin Luther King's life, actually. He was alive when I was born. He, by the time I turned one, he was not. Um, and so in my bone and bones and body, I know something about being in, um, in gestation and sort of arriving into a world of chaos and distress, but one that led through intentional efforts of change, intentional efforts to engage with systems of oppression, to me being able to be here with you. My mother and my grandmother would not have been so lucky. My grandmother only was able to go to school until the second grade. She ended up continuing in the long tradition of women, black women in the South, where, we, where I was born, picking tobacco for much of her life, and then by the time I was born, cleaning houses for the former owners of people like my grandmother. My mother, as well, didn't have very many opportunities, but I came through at a time when change was happening, not because suddenly America woke up to the immorality of what was happening to women like me and others in the, uh, across our time, but because people like you, like us, got involved, like Chelsea was just describing, got involved and made a difference. Some of you may have been a part of those movements. The movements are ongoing. Every generation has to fight for equality and justice. We're learning that, we're relearning that. And so the work that I've been doing has been about helping support awakening to the suffering in our midst that extra surplus suffering, whether it be because of immigration policy that is disproportionately rendering people of color, particularly people of what we call Latino descent, uh, people whose heritage draws uh, on so south of the border, whether it be Mexico, uh, South America, Central America, often more vulnerable now to violence two families being separated, two children basically being disappeared and abused while in the custody of people who are operating in the name of we who call ourselves American citizens. That's happening right now as we sit here, right? And we know this. And so the question is how can we bring all of this beautiful, juicy, loving work directly to bear to help alleviate the suffering of people who are on the front lines, more vulnerable than we are right now. For me, it begins with seeing through practice what has been discussed by all of our speakers in one way or another, our common humanity, whether we see it in, through this, the practice that Dan described so beautifully, the wheel of awareness that can lead to a linkage between differentiation uh, into integration and a sense of we, right? Or through Ubuntu, which is a practice I offered yesterday. I had the privilege of sharing um, a practice for embodied social connection, Ubuntu, which is a practice, an idea, if you will, that has been given to us from our brothers and sisters in Southern Africa and different cultures in Africa. How many of you are familiar with the term Ubuntu? Right? For those who are not, Ubuntu, as it was taught to me, 
refers to this idea. Because I, well, let's start again. I am because you are. I am because you are. And because you are, I am. I am because you are, and because you are, I am. So if we can take a moment and just take a look into the face of somebody sitting next to you, with or close to you, behind you or in front of you, see if you can turn to one other person. And from this place of felt inquiry, what is Ubuntu? What does it mean to say, I exist, I am here, because you are here? And because you are actually physically here, I'm here. I am more here. What does that mean? Ubuntu, right? So the work that I do is an inquiry into how exactly we can practice in a multicultural, dynamic way the lived experience of common humanity. So it's not just an abstraction. The lived experience, the felt experience. So practicing engaged, embodied mindfulness together, okay? Um, these are pictures from some of the work that I've done with communities here as, as, as broadly as San Francisco's Western Edition here, where I've taught mindfulness to social justice advocates and been called on by the district attorney here to support the city in processing a police brutality incident here, um, an incident of um, becoming aware that police in our fair city, this city, um, were found to have been texting and messaging each other and were using some of the worst racist and homophobic slurs and languaging that we might hear anywhere happen here in this city. And so some of the work that I've been involved in around transforming criminal justice has been to work with prosecutors, to work with people in law enforcement, so that nobody is other, including those who are charged with making those hard decisions about how to keep us all safe and protect and serve us, but that they are brought into conversation and connection more effectively with their humanity, their sense of vulnerability, the will within them not only to live but also to be seen as fully human and to connect with the humanity in the community. So I've worked with law enforcement to help process law enforcement on the one hand and community members on the other, right? Because it, we're all in it together. And so the work that I've been doing around seeking to transform our justice system, to bring forth more restorative and transformative practices for reconnecting us from the conditions of separation that we've all inherited as members of this society. So right here in San Francisco, just to say, those of you who've come to this gathering from nearby, you've probably seen the tenderloin and poverty around us, and you might have noticed there's a kind of a disproportionate racial character to some of the, the dis, really despairing poverty and homelessness that you see in San Francisco. Actually, the African-American community in San Francisco is disproportionately not just poor, but very poor, and disproportionately has suffered quite a lot during this era of increasing inequality right here in our midst. What does it mean for us to practice and learn here in ways that mean something to those members of those communities, those communities too? What does it mean for us to be practicing something here that actually can support um, healing in Flint, healing in Arizona, healing at the border? It means thinking about our work, if we're interested in equity and justice, and if we're interested in how mindfulness and compassion practices help, it means seeing uh, the potential for an ecological model of social change that begins with ourselves, but is a flow through of how we are with each other, that we, that interconnectedness, that sense of Ubuntu, and, and always is involved and in, engaged with a collective transformation as well. So those three dimensions of personal, interpersonal, connect, collective, always, always already present and always operating. There is work for us all to do, right? Always, wherever we are. And so while some people will be going and putting their bodies on the line in social awareness uh, movement work, like the young woman who came and shared with us that at that recent protest in Tempe, Arizona, there was an instance where once again, a young black man was char charged 
with assaulting a police officer because he was being arrested and he flailed around a bit in a way that hit an officer, and suddenly now he's being charged, never been charged with any crime before, with a felony of assault against a police officer. This is how the criminal justice system operates in ways that members of my community will say it's actually an injustice system in some ways as it applies in the lives of black and brown and, let's say it, indigenous, native Lati uh, men as well in this country. Very disproportionately more vulnerable. Where are their voices in this conversation? Where are their voices here? So we must bear witness. Yes, we must bear, thank you. We must bear witness to that kind of suffering. We cannot let these beautiful practices be kind of, um, you know, a kind of, yes, on the one hand, we all need to heal, let's say that. And so often we br we're drawn into these conversations because we know we are suffering and we are here for that, for our own healing. But may it not end there. May we, from this place of extra strength, be able to turn to the suffering of others. Who is this woman? Let's say we move now to a micro practice of from the place of strength, right? I said, let's feel it from anxiety and, and a sense of fear. Imagine now shifting. Feel your body into your dignity. Feel the ground beneath your feet. Feel the linear dignity, the width of your relational support in this beautiful, powerful community. And from this place, what do you see in the face of a woman like this? From this place, what do you see in the face of a woman like this? Who is this woman? Her name is the Baroness Doreen Lawrence. She is a member of the House of Lords in the UK, named a member of the House of Lords by Parliament, by leadership of government in, in, uh, in Britain, Great Britain, conjoined with the royal family. Because in 1993, she had the misfortune of living through her son's murder racially motivated murder in southeast London, in a suburb in London. Her son, Stephen Lawrence, was actually murdered. And from that experience, she became a campaigner for not just justice for her son, but justice for all such sons who, be, who would be rendered uh, vulnerable because of their identity, as her son was. She became a national hero for her courage in standing up and bearing witness to what had happened to her son. And it, through that process, creating a reckoning with racism as a feature of the law enforcement systems in Great Britain. Transforming those systems such that they named that they had institutional racism that got in the way of them properly investigating her son's murder, got in the way of them properly charging the murders. And ultimately, she was able, after 15, 16 years of steadfast stamina, not fragile. We, we, can be, we can be strong when we want to be, not fragile. Engagement with this, she was able to help change the systems in the direction that would support everybody from undue application of police power. That's what I think we who are concerned about injustice and want to see a better world might be able to offer as we engage with the world from a place of mindfulness. Um, how do I know this? I was asked to go to Parliament um, last December, and at, in Parliament I met uh, the Baroness Lawrence, a member of Parliament by, by virtue of being a member of the House of Lords. Parliament there is actually bringing meditation directly to members of the House. And so in the course of my humble opportunity to present there and discuss these same issues with the parliament in UK, I had an opportunity that of course I took, I took, you know, I said yes to, to offer meditative practice to members of the House of Lords and through that process met the Honorable, the Baroness Lawrence. And in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with me, what she shared was she was there and had been sitting and taking, up, taking advantage of the opportunity to meditate with other members of the, of the House of Lords, other members of Parliament, because she needed to be reminded of the deeper resources for the justice work that she was committed to doing for the rest of her life on behalf of all children there. So these practices are, whew, they are deeply powerful. They can support people in staying, you know, in a 20-year, 30-year, lifelong struggle for fairness and justice. How many of you know we're at a time in our life 
where we are going to need more steadfastness around such issues. Whether it be, as we've discussed, climate change, um, tribalization, right, the, the way in which we are polarized against each other more and more these days. These practices are one way, one way of helping us develop the stamina, right? People talk about something called white fragility. That's a learned conditional thing. We are all strong. We can all be fragile sometimes, but these practices help us feel our way into our body, in body strength, individually, interpersonally, and as a collective. How many of you are feeling it as you sit here today? You are not alone. You are not alone in your desire for something better, and we can do this together. So I've written a book, yes. Um, September of this year, it'll come out. It's an opportunity for us to lean in, develop some practice and book clubs around just what we're talking about here. But the real question really is, what is it? As we turn toward these kinds of issues and look at what in ourselves gets kind of stuck and the patterns and habits we have around seeing certain things and not seeing others, what is it? that we need to do, how can our mindfulness and compassion practices support us in developing the strength, the steadfastness, the stamina, to turn toward the things that we've been trained not to see, and to actually break through whatever might be keeping us apart from feeling each other's common humanity, feeling the love we know we have in our hearts for each other, and acting from that as the core of our practice, not as something we might do once in a while on the side, peripheral. That's what we're here for. That's what some of us are here for. I am here for that. I'm here with you for that. I believe that we are infinitely co-creating and co-creating this world together. And it's for that reason that I stand here before you deeply aware that love is my lineage. You are my kin. And this work that we must do to transform the world is something that we are prepared for by these practices. How many of you are with me? All right. <laughs> May you be well. May you be well. I thank you for these few moments. I thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.